Hello and welcome to another Try Teachers video. In today's video, we're going to be analysing the poem The Morning Sun is Shining by Olive Schreiner. The poet Olive Schreiner, she was born in 1855 and died in 1920. She was a South African poet, author and activist. So she was quite ahead of her time in terms of her activism for feminism, anti-racism and anti-war. She lived during the Anglo-Boer War, but this poem is not actually about any of her activism ventures, um, but it's just really interesting to know in terms of this poet and what she accomplished. If we have a look at our title, The Morning Sun is Shining, notice the capitalizations. Capitalizations always show significance. If you think about morning morning has a connotation of hope or renewal optimism it's a new opportunity there's this representation that it's a new day it's a new opportunity um and shining is also a really positive word so it has positive connotations of hope and light and beauty our first quatrain so this is this poem is one singular stanza but we can split it up into four different quatrains or different groups of four lines. The morning sun is shining on the green green willow tree and sends a golden sunbeam to dance upon my knee. If we look at the first two lines we have anaphora. The anaphora is repeated throughout the poem. Anaphora is the repetition of a word or phrase at the start of subsequent lines and in this case the repetition of the the emphasizes the abundance of the beauty of nature. The morning sun is shining on. We spoke about that as well because that has got to do with it's the same line as the title. The green, green willow tree. Notice the enjambment in those lines, the run on lines. And this emphasizes how the beauty of nature is limitless and unrestrained. It is not confined or defined by nature um, or by conventional punctuation. You can view this poem in sort of a romantic light. The romantic poetry movement was all about praising nature and really admiring the beauty of nature and about linking emotion to nature. And so this poem definitely falls into that category. Green, there are a lot of colors that are used throughout this poem. And so green is, has connotations of symbol, it symbolizes growth and life and prosperity. Um, and so the repetition of the green emphasizes that message further. Willow tree, notice the natural imagery, and natural imagery usually showcases something that's righteous, something that's good, something that's beautiful. And sends a golden sunbeam. Notice throughout the poem how many times sun is repeated. Sun, sunbeam, sunshine, which is really emphasizing this beauty and light. Golden, once again, we have a beautiful color being brought here. Colors are important as they enrich the imagery. And these particular colours are colours of positivity. Gold has connotations of rich, beautiful. This is an example of personification as well. The sun is sending a golden sunbeam. But a better example of personification is in the fourth line, to dance upon my knee. The sunbeam, notice the enjambment in that line as well, the sunbeam is dancing. This is personification, it's emphasising the power of the sunbeam and the happiness and the joy that it brings. Um, dance has a really positive connotation. Moving on to Quatrain 2. The fountain bubbles merrily, the yellow locust spring of life and light and sunshine. The happy brown birds sing. Once again, we see the anaphora here, the fountain bubbles merrily, another example of personification. Think about if you describe someone as bubbly, it means they're really upbeat, they're really positive. And the fact that they are merry, merry so merrily, um, is a human quality of joy. And if you think about going back to the word bubbles, if you think about bubbles, it's a really fun and playful word. The connotations of like of children. Also, you think about water and when water is bubbling, there's usually an abundance of it. So this is showing us that um you know this nature is thriving there is this beauty in the air the yellow locust spring yellow is indicative of sunlight and joy spring over here um is polysemic it can refer to the season spring or it can refer to spring in terms of you know jumping and it has connotations of excitement and spirit and enthusiasm and energy and optimism 
of life and light. Notice the alliteration of the L sound there. It's a lilting and longing sound, which emphasizes the lightness and excitement. The longingness is almost the sense of lethargy, but in a quite a positive way. And sunshine. Notice the repetition of the sun imagery, as we said. The happy brown birds sing. Notice the alliteration brown birds. Um, it really is a bouncy or excited sound. And notice that the birds aren't just a part of the scenery, but they're feeling the joy too, because it doesn't just say, um, you know, we are hearing the songs of the birds. The brown birds are actually singing. So we're using that active voice. Now we get our third quatrain, and our third quatrain is still positive, just like the other two quatrains before it, but it has a hint towards the melancholy of the final quatrain, so you'll see if you notice it. Notice the anaphora here, once again, emphasizing that abundance in nature. The earth is clothed with beauty, the air is filled with song, the yellow thorn trees load the wind with odors sweet and strong. So if you notice, we have the word clothed, filled and load in this quatrain. And this is important because these three words have connotations of abundance. And it's indicative of this abundance of beauty in nature, this abundance of splendidness or of splendor. Um, the earth is clothed in beauty. That's a bit of personification. The air is filled with songs. We're looking at all these different aspects and we're just indicating through imagery and through these, this beautiful diction, how beautiful the earth is, how wonderful nature is, and how happy it makes the speaker. Um, song is being repeated, you know, that we have the birds that were singing, now we have a reference to song, and in the final stanza we're going to have a question of what song truly is. And then this is where we get the hint towards the melancholy of the th final quatrain. Yellow, once again, is positive, but thorn trees, we can see this in two regards. Firstly, the image of thorn trees can represent a South African landscape because in South Africa we see a lot of thorn trees. It's one of the indigenous um, plants that we have. But it could also be hinting at the last quatrain, which is melancholic, because thorn trees can cause harm and they don't provide much protection from the elements. So it could be hinting towards the final quatrain where the speaker is going to talk about um, something negative or this depression that she feels or this questioning and introspection that she is going through. So the yellow thorn trees load the wind with odours sweet and strong. And then my next thing is this word odours because odours is a really interesting word choice because odours are typically, um, you know, they typically have negative connotations or something smelling bad. Otherwise, if you wanted to do something positive with regard to smell, you would say the scent right? So the use of odors could hint towards that final stanza, but they are still described as sweet and strong. Notice the sibilant sound there, the repetition of the S sound, um, and it really creates a calm and gentle feeling. Moving on to the final stanza. There is a hand I never touch and a face I never see. Now what is sunshine? What is song? Now what is light to me? So we've had these th three really blissful, beautiful quatrains and we get to the final quatrain and there's a remarkable shift in tone. Um, and we'll talk about this more when we go through the structural analysis in the next slide. But there is a major shift in tone from blissful to introspective and melancholic. And now the speaker is going to reflect on what she's just said about nature. There is one example of a personal pronoun in terms of my in the first um, quatrain, but the use of I in this very first line of the stanza shows that there is a shift now. We're not just going to be talking about nature, we're going to be talking about the speaker's interpretation of it or the speaker's reflection on it. There is a hand I never touch. Notice touch and then see the use of the senses. Just like use of colour, the use of the senses communicates effectively with the reader. There is a hand and a face. This is example, an example of synecdoche. Synecdoche is when a part represents a whole or when a whole represents a part. In this case, she's not just missing a hand or just not just missing a face, right? She's missing a person. But the use of synecdoche, this is really significant because it really draws out the longing and the pain she feels as she um, reaches for this person in her mind and a face I never see. So we have this understanding that 
this person has gone away, that she has lost this person. It is personal, therefore, because she is remarking on a personal incident. However, it's universal or we can adapt it to be universal because it's not really clear in terms of has the person passed on? Has the person, have they, is it, has it been a romantic relationship where the person has broken up with her? So we don't actually know the specifics, but what we do know is that she has experienced this loss. And then as a result of this loss, we have the final two lines, which are so poignant and so heart-wrenching. Um, now what is sunshine? What is song? Now what is life to me? Light to me. So we've had the mention of sunshine and song and light in the previous um, quatrains where we really understood the speaker's fascination with nature and how nature is so beautiful. And now she's, have to re she's having to redefine these aspects of her life. Um, as a result of this loss. She is questioning. She needs to figure out what is sunshine to her now? What is song? What is actual light to her in this new post-loss loss existence? Notice the anaphora here, and this anaphora is different to the previous anaphoras. Now it is emphasizing how much questioning she's doing, how everything seems to be lost. It seems to be overwhelming. The repetition of now was also indicative of the fact that in the past she had all this beauty or she associated all this beauty with, um, you know, with her life or this beauty of nature was her life and now she's questioning it. In terms of our structure, we have a rhyme scheme of A, B, C, B, D, E, F, E, G, H, I, H, J, K, L, K. So it's a really wonderful rhyme scheme which adds to the lyrical element, the song-like quality of the poem. If we look, it's one long stanza, one single stanza, and this is showing this continuous thought of feeling. It's showing that the speaker is one with nature, but we do have four quatrains within it, which each end with a full stop. The first quatrain sets the scene for what is happening. The second one expands on the scene's description. The third one indicates the abundance of nature. And the fourth one is a shift to a melancholic introspection or reflection. The rhythm is regular and it's song-like, which links to that rhyme scheme. There's lots of anaphora and enjambment, which emphasizes this theme of abundance and excitement. The tone of the poem, at first glance, is vibrant, blissful, peaceful, serene and calming. And then, as we progress into the final four lines, we get a heavy-hearted, lonely, melancholic, uncertain, reflective, contemplative, and introspective tone. The mood is joyful, passionate, and reflective. The theme of the poem is about the beauty of nature and how it can offer solace and meaning. The joy of human connection and the loneliness of loss. It's about reevaluating life after loss. This is really one of my favorite poems. I hope that you understand it in a clearer way after watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.